Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 30th meeting in 2018. Could I ask everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, so we'll move straight on to agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item four in private, and that is to review the evidence it has heard on the Transport Scotland Bill at stage one. Are members agreed? Yes. That we are agreed. We then move on to item two, which is the Transport Scotland Bill, and I'd like to invite members, if there are any members who wish to, to declare any interest that they have in relation to this. Uh, Stuart. Um, I'm the Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. Does any other member wish to declare any interest? No. This is our sixth evidence session on the Transport Scotland Bill and we'll be taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure and Connectivity and his Scottish Government officials. This evidence session will be structured in three parts, recognising the large number of topics contained within the Transport Bill. The first part will cover buses and smart ticketing. Part two will cover low emission zones and parking. And part three will cover roadworks, canals and regional transport partnerships. Uh, there will be a changeover of officials during each session, but I'd like to start off by welcoming uh, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. I think this is the first time that you've Just been in front of the committee, so uh, good morning. And I think for the first session, I've got this right, you've got Pete Grant, a bus policy team leader, Gordon Hanning, head of Integrated Ticketing Unit, Kevin Gibson and Debbie Baer, both solicitors. Cabinet Secretary, um, you have been given, I think, a generous three minutes, uh, but no more than four, uh, <laughs> to make an opening statement on the bill uh, before we have any questions. So, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning uh, to the committee. And, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to uh, meet with the committee this morning. I'm aware that the committee has heard from a broad range of voices and viewpoints on the Transport Bill uh, over the past few months. It's a testament to the detailed approach that the committee has taken over stage one, uh, that such a wide spectrum of evidence has been heard from across civic society. I'd like to commend the committee for that diligent approach. It has complemented the significant consultation and engagement that the government has done on these matters. I'm glad to be here to be able to set out my perspective uh, to inform your considerations. You'll be aware that this is a wide-ranging piece of legislation, uh, taking forward a suite of measures to improve journeys for the travelling public across Scotland. These range from measures to improve bus patronage, including smart ticketing, to improve air quality in our cities, increase safety and efficiency of roadworks, and addressing parking issues. It also makes some necessary technical improvements to quite specific areas, for example, uh, ensuring uh, more appropriate financial flexibility in governance arrangements for some public bodies. In developing the bill, a collaborative approach has been taken so that its measures are informed by those that they will affect. This engagement has continued throughout the scrutiny of the bill and will continue as the regulations develop. Whilst it matters such as low emission zones, uh, an improved uh, framework for bus services and prohibitions on irresponsible parking will benefit many, the bill will also uh, and should uh, not be seen in isolation. Successful transport planning and provision requires a series of interconnected measures and approaches. The bill represents specific areas which have been identified as requiring primary legislation. But there is a host of work going on across my portfolio to drive improvement, not least uh, the current review of the National Transport Strategy. This wide-ranging strategy has seen extensive and sustained engagement with stakeholders and citizens across Scotland. It is forward-looking, planning our next set of shared priorities with a draft strategy due for consultation in 2019. We anticipate that the National Transport Strategy would set the context for any future consideration of legislative measures beyond the current measures pr proposed in the Bill. On the Bill, uh, as uh, well as the face-to-face uh, -face evidence from Scottish Government officials and the various interested parties that you have heard, 
evidence from in your sessions. I am aware the committee has received around 90 responses to its call for evidence. And the SPICE briefing uh, from parliamentary analysts uh, shows broad support. I am sure uh, this will give you a flavour of the breadth and complexity of the provisions within the Bill, mirrored in the varied views uh, of those uh, provisions. I am also aware the Committee wrote to the Scottish Government with specific questions on a number of areas and received a detailed response. And I hope that this has proved helpful in your considerations. I am keen to hear further from members today to see where I can build on that. I understand, as you said, convener, that these will be taken on a thematic basis and it will be starting with the provisions relating to bus services and smart ticketing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the first question this morning is from John Finney. John. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, you described the, the bill as wide-ranging, and that's certainly correct, but you will be aware from the evidence that people believe it lacks ambition. And, and the wherewithal to address the decline in bus patronage, which is significantly caused by issues like um, congestion, which immediately impacts on journey times and reliability. What, what would you have to say about that, please? Well, look, I think the, the bill takes forward a range of provisions which are about helping to support uh, bus service provision um, uh, right across the country. I think it is, though, worth reflecting the fact that Bus patronage uh, is, uh, has been in decline since the 1960s. In some parts of the country, it's exhilarated more than others. And there's a whole variety of reasons as to why that is the, the case. And we don't want to stand back and just allow uh, patronage levels to continue to decline without taking proactive measures that can help to encourage people to make use of the, uh, of the bus. So that's why in the provisions within the bill, uh, we've taken forward a range of measures which I believe um, will help to support local authorities and bus operators in delivering more effective bus services within their respective areas. So the provisions around um, uh, the uh, bus service improvement partnerships, the provisions for low emission zones, uh, uh, combined with smart ticketing, all of which can actually help to support and encourage people to make use of uh, buses. If I can just maybe take one example around how the legislation, I think, can help specifically in this area. Um, if you look at um, the average speed of a bus going through somewhere like Glasgow uh, city centre, I I'm told it's something in the region of three miles per hour. Um, if that could be increased to six miles per hour, then uh, the journey time uh, would, uh, would shorten considerably for people. It would be more efficient and people would have more reliability in the services. So the provision of low emission zones uh, provides with an opportunity to take forward measures that help to improve things such as journey times and reliability measures, uh, which can help to encourage people to make greater use of uh, the bus. So I don't, um, I wouldn't accept uh, that the bill lacks ambition. Um, I think it takes forward a range of uh, uh, what I would consider to be pragmatic measures uh, that can help to improve uh, patronage levels uh, and also help to address some of the issues that local authorities highlighted to us that they wanted to have action taken on to try and address issues around uh, bus use. However, you didn't mention congestion, which we're consistently told is a factor that affects reliability and impacts in other ways. Is that a lost opportunity? Is that something you would look at to, to putting in at a future date or be supportive of being put in at a future date? Well, there is... Um, uh, you know, the bill is to take forward a range of measures at this present time. Uh, there may be further measures we should take forward at a later date, but I do think that low emission zones uh, provide the opportunity to address issues around congestion, uh, given the way in which they will, uh, uh, they will operate. Um, so I don't think the bill uh, doesn't address those issues but, uh, uh, in itself, uh, but it has measures within it that can help to address issues relating to congestion. One of the things that's different with the way in which um, the uh, bus service improvement partnerships will operate is that it goes beyond just that of looking at infrastructure. So do we give, do we, give, um, uh, do we uh, provide uh, bus prioritisation in certain areas? Uh, it also allows them to look at things such as frequency of service. It looks at uh, fare levels as well. It provides them with a whole range of different uh, provisions, much more flexibility in dealing with these types of issues in a way in which they don't have with the, uh, the, the existing QP arrangements. So, um, so I wouldn't say that it doesn't address the issue of congestion itself, because I think low emissions zones can play a part in that, and also the use of uh, bus service improvement partnerships can also help to address those issues. 
do you see a, a, a role for perhaps connected with the congestion, the potential for uh, non-domestic parking levies or workplace levies, freeing up space? Well, it's not a provision which is within the bill, no. um, and it's not something which we have consulted on. Uh, if there was a, if there was an appetite for local authorities to go down that particular route, uh, then I'd certainly be uh, willing to engage with them and to discuss that matter. But it is something which I would, be cons I would consider as being a matter for local authorities to consider taking forward. But if there is a, as I say, if there's an appetite for that, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to have that discussion with them, but there's no provisions within the bill to, to provide that. OK, I, I would hope the Scottish Government would have taken a, a lead in that, but perhaps that can form part of some future discussions. Finally, if I may, uh, convener, you, you touched on the national transport strategy. I wonder if there's another lost opportunity um, that may yet have an opportunity to correct, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and that relates to the issue of poverty and the impact that public transport has on that. It's hugely significant. Now, as I understand, there's a poverty strategy. What regard should this have to playing its part? Every le piece of legislation should try and uh, interweave with others to improve. Would you be open to looking at that, the impact that this could have in addressing issues of poverty, which are significant, particularly not just in urban areas, but in rural areas too. Do you mean specifically issues within the bill yes, or indeed. within the National Transport Strategy Review? Uh, the link across all three. Uh, well, can I say yes? And I, I would hope that uh, when we publish the uh, draft of the National Transport Strategy, uh, that should be apparent, uh, because I'm very conscious of the need to make sure that uh, public transport provision uh, is uh, something which is um, is accessible to people who are in lower incomes. Uh, I'm also very clear about the need to make sure that some of the advances and changes which are going to happen in uh, transport in the next five to ten years uh, are not uh, advances which exclude people from lower income uh, backgrounds as well. Uh, and I want to uh, to make sure we've got a very clear focus on that. Uh, so, you know, fairly recently I was. Um, uh, highlighting to a number of policy officials at a conference the need to make sure that with the advent of ever-increasing access to um, electric vehicles uh, and uh, other active travel options that we are making sure that these don't become middle-class pastimes uh, that are accessible to those in better incomes, but they exclude people from lower-income backgrounds. We need to make sure we're very targeted in ensuring that we are reaching into our hard-to-get-at communities. Uh, so that they benefit uh, from these provisions going forward. So um, I'm very clear about that being a, a, a core strand that will be running through the new national transport strategy when we when we publish it. Okay, thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank you. Um, some very long and detailed answers there, Cabinet Secretary. You, 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 I think we're on question one, and, and and we got seven minutes to do that. We may be here till tea time anyway at, at that rate so uh, concise answers always appreciated uh, Stuart wants to come in and then we're going to move to Colin um, just picking up the traffic congestion and uh, cabinet secretary you referred to uh, uh, bus prioritization we already have that of course in bus lanes but the enforcement of that appears to be pretty variable uh, and the hours over which they operate are very different in different parts, which is very confusing for drivers who can't read the six lines on a, a post at the side of the road. Is there an opportunity in this legislation or otherwise to try and crank up the enforcement and standardise the way they work? Well, um, uh, enforcement provision in terms of where it's been decriminalised is a matter for, uh, for the relevant local authorities, and it's important they are taking appropriate enforcement measures. Uh, to deal with any uh, breaches of these matters. Uh, I do believe with the introduction of low emission zones, there's an opportunity for local authorities to look at how they can uh, change their enforcement measures uh, to be more effective, to also uh, uh, to drive cultural change around these matters in a way that uh, may not have been there in the past. Um, uh, so I think there's an opportunity to look at, them, uh, look at the whole issue of enforcement afresh uh, and how local authorities do that within their own respective areas. Uh, but I'm also conscious that there at times can be inconsistency in approach uh, and how different rules are applied. And one of the things that I'm keen to ensure we do with the low emission zones is that we have a consistency of approach and the standards which will apply um, across different local authority areas. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that the, the introduction of low emission zones can help to give a greater consistency to that. Yeah. 
In, indeed, Stuart, we will come back in some depth to low emission zones. Uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. Colin, uh, yours is Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, can, can you explain why you've chosen to, to limit local authorities to providing bus services only where there is an unmet need uh, and no private um, competition, rather than allowing other local authorities to, to follow the sort of municipal bus company model that we have here in, in Lothians, for example? Yeah, principally because from the consultation and engagement we had with local authorities in, uh, in drafting the bill, the primary focus was to look at trying to identify means by which we could deal with issues where there was unmet need. Uh, and that's why the bill has been drafted in such a way as to provide them with the additional scope to look at either providing services themselves, to look at franchising uh, as an option to address areas where there is unmet need. So, um, it's been drafted very specifically to give them the ability to address an issue that they highlighted that they felt they needed powers to address. Since then, <clears throat> possibly with the exception maybe of the, of the private bus operators, all the evidence the committee have received, including um, pretty much unanimously from local authorities, is that the provision around unmet need doesn't go far enough. They would like to see that removed and the power to actually fully run bus services in their area. So given the evidence the committee has, um, given the clear evidence I'm sure the government has since the bill was published, will you consider dropping that provision around unmet need and allow local authorities to run bus companies? Um, it wouldn't be so much about dropping it, it may be about adding to it. So um, my mind's not closed to the possibility of extending it further uh, beyond the provisions that we have in the bill at the present moment uh, to, allow bills, uh, to allow local authorities or local transport authorities to look at uh, the provision of services. So um, I'm aware of the evidence which the, the committee has received from some local authorities in this matter, uh, and my mind's open to the possibility of extending the provisions within the bill to give them greater scope to look at running bus services within their own areas. Okay. One of the other things that I've come across in the evidence to the committee is around, uh, from, from mainly local authorities and others, uh, is around um, concerns about the process for developing and approving uh, local service franchises. Uh, the suggestion has been made that they present a significant barrier to the use of, of this power. Are you satisfied that the processes are streamlined enough and they will be fully utilised by, by local authorities and bus companies? Yes, I am. Um, I think there is a, we shouldn't underestimate the decision for a local authority, a local transport authority, to intervene into the, uh, 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 the bus market uh, through the use of uh, a franchise is a, 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 is a very significant intervention. And it's important that when uh, an LTA or a local authority choose to go down that particular route, that there's a clear process that they've gone through in assessing whether, one, it's necessary, two, um, uh, what's the evidence to justify the provision of a service through a franchise or uh, through a service on their own, uh, but particularly through a, fran a franchise, uh, and to understand the impact that that will actually have uh, and the process that's been put in place is to help to ensure that is the case. Um, the independent panel element that we've introduced is to, uh, is to make sure that there's an independent decision around this matter and to check that the local authority have gone through that process thoroughly and in a detailed fashion. Um, and uh, it then allows uh, the panel to make its own recommendation on the matter. So, yeah, I'm confident it's the, uh, it's the right balance, uh, but it's not about trying to stop them from doing it. It's about making sure there's a robust mechanism in place in conducting the assessment to determine whether that's the right intervention it should take forward. And, and do you think it goes far enough? Is it not a, a case of bills, possibly a missed opportunity to follow the type of, of regulation they have, for example, in, in Transport for London, where they really do regulate those bus services? Is that not a missed opportunity? Isn't that the type of power that we should be given to, to transport agencies and local authorities to really regulate those services? So to give individual LTAs and local authorities the ability to regulate bus services in their own respective areas? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, I, don't think that's a, I, I think that the challenges in trying to do that, given the nature of the, uh, the deregulated system we have at the present moment, would be very, very significant. And I think uh, many local authorities would have real difficulties in being able to manage that effectively. Um, uh, so my view, no, I don't think that's the appropriate provision that should be within the bill, and that's why there isn't such a provision within the bill. Peter, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, uh, <coughs> morning, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, surely one of the main reasons that there are unmet needs uh, for, for bus services is because these services have proved to be unprofitable and there's no, no, no private 
company would, would run them because they would lose money on them, but yet you're expecting local authorities to pick up some of these routes. There might be a need, but if it's going to be an un unprofitable route forever and a day, how does the local authority fund that? Well, they do some of that just now at the present time. Uh, so they spend over £50 million uh, a year from funding which they get through the Scottish Government for meeting what is classed as being socially required uh, uh, transport services, uh, because these are communities which, if they didn't have access to public transport uh, in the form of a bus service, they wouldn't have any public transport provision. I have it in my own constituency when the local authority choose to subsidise particular bus routes because they know they're not commercially viable, but they know they're socially necessary. Uh, as well, and that will continue to be the case, particularly in our rural communities, uh, where it may be the only link for those who don't have access to uh, a car uh, or any other forms of transport. And local authorities, using the new mechanisms we're having with through the, the bus service improvement partnerships, I think helps to create a system which is much more focused on working in partnership with the local authority, the LTA, and the uh, and the bus service operators to make sure that they get that balance right. I accept that there are, there are subsidies available, but you know the, 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 it's, it's like everything else. It's a limited pot, and, the, and yeah, you know I can I can imagine routes in, in North East Aberdeenshire that would be would would be absolutely welcome, but the, the Aberdeenshire Council can't fund them. So I, I don't know what is your, is your, your view is that there shouldn't be any any socially required bus services no, supported by local authorities. Absolutely not. I, I, my point is that the money is tight. Local authorities have, have had the you know cuts to their budgets over the years, and money is tight. And, and you know there are there are the bus routes that have ceased to to be run by the local authorities <coughs> simply because they can't afford to carry on doing it. So my my point is exactly the opposite. There needs to be more money possibly for that. Well, I suppose if, uh, if the UK government keep cutting our budget, there's only so much more we can actually pass on, uh, Mr Chapman, so, uh, uh, which obviously has an impact on local authority budgets as well. So there's a, as you correctly say, there is a limited pot. We try our very best to support local authorities where we can, um, but um, I certainly wouldn't be of the view that we should start simply writing off socially required uh, bus services, particularly in our rural communities. And... I know that some of our local authorities work very hard to try and help to sustain these services where well they can. I'm going to bring Maureen in now, and, and then I'm going to bring Jamie in afterwards. Maureen. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. And can I welcome you to your post? Morning, panel. Um, following on from what's been said about a number of local authorities giving us evidence have said that they're unlikely to use these powers because of financial constraints and wondering where the money's come. We've had a letter uh, just this week from SPT on that particular issue. But um, there are in a number of areas, including in the northeast of Scotland, community bus transport. And um, you may recall that um, the Scottish Government has helped with community, had a fund at one point to help community groups buy uh, buses um, for community use, transport use. How do you see existing community uh, transport and perhaps future community transport feeding into all this um, more um, bus routes that are not commercially viable but per are, are needed in communities? Well, there's not a specific provision within the bill as such for community transport that you refer to. Um, one of the purposes behind the uh, bus service improvement partnerships is for uh, local authorities to look at uh, what's necessary within that particular area to try and improve bus services and to work with the bus service providers. Now, that may also include looking at what's available from in the form of community transport within that area to look at how they can help to improve the delivery of uh, bus services. And it's very much a partnership between the bus operators and the local authority and how they should operate, which is different from how the existing system by and large operates. And when they're carrying out that assessment and putting, looking to put a plan in place, I would be expecting them to also be looking at what community transport is available within that area uh, to decide on how that plan should be developed uh, and then consulted on within the local community as well. So although there's not a specific provision around um, uh, community transport, uh, I believe that bus service improvement partnerships uh, provide a, a, a framework uh, that allows uh, the provisions around community transport to be taken into account um, when bus service improvement partnerships are being considered for a, an individual area. 
So, if necessary, will you amend the bill to make sure that community transport groups are, are, are not excluded or forgotten about? I don't know if the bill needs to be amended in that sense. Is it because when you when you when you when you undertake a, a, a bus service improvement partnership, there's a, a plan which needs to be developed by the LTA or the local authority, uh, and that is informed by making an assessment of um, bus patronage services, etc., which are in that area. Um, that would include looking at what there is in the way of community transport that's available as well. Uh, to then develop a plan that can help to address the unmet need that they actually have uh, or whether they want to see improvements in the service as well. So community transport provision would be considered within that um, uh, as part of the planning and assessment process that a, an LTA or a local authority would undertake at that particular point. Uh, but I'm more than happy to take away um, uh, the thought on whether there is um, uh, whether there's uh, a means by whether it be within the bill or whether it be in the, reg the secondary legislation, the regulations, uh, to make it quite explicit that when they are carrying out that assessment, they should be looking at community transport as well. Thank you. Jamie, you want to come in and then Rich Love. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Um, I, I mean, surely the reason that bus patronage is declining, just following on from John Finney's opening question, is that if the bus doesn't go from where you are to where you need to be at the times that you wish to use it and at the frequency that you wish to use it, uh, unless you make substantive changes to the, 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 the operation of, of how these services run, then there really will be no huge difference. I think I, I appreciate there are things around LEZs that may decrease traffic levels in cities, which may make journey times faster. I appreciate there are uh, issues in the bill around smart ticketing, which may make it easier, but it may not, and changes to the franchise model for local authorities, which may or may not mean some of them may run services. But I, I can't see any tangible uh, or direct uh, um, uh, things in this legislation that actually says to me with any confidence that, as a result of it, we will see bus patronage increase or at least stop declining. Could you give me some examples? Well, I think it would be it, it wrong, I think, to suggest that um, uh, uh, the journey times are sole the reason as to why uh, bus patronage has been declining. Bus, bus patronage has been declining since the 1960s for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, if you look at, for example, um, at places like in Glasgow, uh, West Central Scotland, uh, it's been much more marked. Um, there is evidence to suggest that's because car ownership has increased during that time. Uh, we saw bus patronages decline into town centres on the basis that um, uh, the way in which uh, people are using town centres has changed, uh, particularly in recent years with the uh, online retail, uh, which has had an impact on our town centres in a variety of different ways, including uh, bus patronage levels. Uh, so there's a whole variety of different reasons as to uh, what can impact on bus patronage. There's no doubt to me, though, one of the things that um, um, uh, uh, it, we should do is to look at whether there are measures that we can take that help to improve reliability around journey times for people who are making use of the bus. So I think your point around, um, uh, uh, you know, if the bus doesn't goes at that time and it doesn't get to the right place or the place you want to go to at that time, it can have an impact. But I don't think it's the only reason. It's, uh, it's much more complex than that. If there are things that we can do to help to improve or to uh, create more reliable journey times, then it may be a more attractive option to individuals. So, for example, the use of LEZs in terms of controlling, particularly in our town centres, uh, the vehicles which are able to enter those areas uh, allows us to address, in part, some of the congestion issues but it can also help to address issues relating to journey times uh, that bus services have because it reduces congestion, uh, which allows them to be able to give a shorter journey time, but also a more reliable journey time uh, for people to make use of it. If that is then used in partnership alongside uh, a bus service improvement plan, which goes much wider than the uh, quality partnerships that we have at the present moment. It's much more flexible, it involves consultation as well, uh, but it's much more focused on looking at a range of different things that can be done, not just the infrastructure, so bus prioritisation, but also um, uh, the, the frequency of service, the fares of services as well. It gives local authorities much more scope to take forward practical measures uh, both from a policy and also from an infrastructure point of view that can help to improve journey times and reliability of them. So uh, it's not that 
there is one thing that we can do. There's a combination of different things that I believe can actually help to address these matters. Uh, and that's to try and help to address some of these patronage issues which the bus industry have been facing over um, a considerable uh, number of years now. Uh, uh, well, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to get into trouble with the rest of the committee if, if I cut them out of asking their questions because you're giving long answers. And I, I, I would ask you, please, to keep the answers as short as possible so I don't lose the rest of the committee. I've got Richard Lau waiting, Stuart Stevenson, I've got a question, then we've got a lot more. So if I could ask you to keep a focused answer, um, rather like short journey times on buses, everyone enjoys them, to get to the destination quicker. Cabinet Secretary. OK, I'll try my best, but I hope uh, for Mr Green that gives him an insight into the use of several elements within the bill can help to address the very issue that he has a concern about. Thank you. I'm going to bring Richard Dial in and then Stuart Stevenson. Richard, a short question. <coughs> I'm, I'm just going to ask for a yes or no answer. Um, some say patronage is falling because you can't get a bus and you can't rely on the bus, getting a bus. Some say we're only tinkering with bus transport. So why, what do you say to taking back buses back under public control, say an area at a time, over a period of years? Yes or no? Sorry, yes or no to? To taking public transport back under public control. Uh, bus transport back under public control. So the provisions within the bill give scope for local authorities to take forward measures in their areas if they see there's an issue of Only if the need. operators allow them to do and what so. I, and what I have said earlier on is that if there is a if there is a view, uh, as you've heard from some local authorities, that they wish to have greater powers to be able to look at their own, no own bus services, their own bus services, then I'm open to looking at but the possibility say of doing no money. that. Will we make money available to local authorities, Richard, on a, a, on a block grant basis for them yeah. to then decide on how they allocate that resource to, uh, to different areas? So it's neither, within neither areas. a yes or a no. OK. Thank you. We're definitely parking that one there. Stuart, it's, it's you uh, now. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Now, we've had some preliminary discussion about bus services improvement partnerships. Um, looking at the construction of the bill, uh, we've got pages 12 to 29. Uh, 18 pages that cover the issue. Um, they replace 18 pages in the 2001 Act, uh, which covered statutory bus partnerships and voluntary bus partnerships. Um, the uh, explanatory notes from pages 15 to 24 um, purport to explain uh, the difference between the 2001 uh, Act and what's now proposed. I confess Cabinet Secretary, and I've read it several times, I can find no material difference. Can you give me three sentences that identify the material differences? And if the answer is as long as the provision in the bill, perhaps a written answer might be preferable. Would that be fine, convener? Absolutely. So it may be they are as long as the provisions within the bill, so it may be helpful then, Kevin, if I do write to the committee and say that out in more detail, if that would be helpful to the member. Specifically, the differences between the previous provisions and the new ones is okay. what I'm looking for. OK. Uh, well, there are, there are a couple of uh, different, very specific measures which are available within uh, bus service improvement partnerships that are not available within QPs. To the next section. I mean, the committee has been out and carried out various uh, visits, and we went to the uh, Glasgow and looked at the SPT and, 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 and the way buses work there, which was incredibly useful. And one of the reasons we were given for the decline in buses was the fact that of journey times. You've constantly quoted during this morning's session that LEZs will reduce journey times. The evidence that we had at that committee meeting, what was going to reduce journey times was bus lanes and the use of restricted parking and use along streets uh, to allow buses to move freely and on time. Do you believe that bus lanes would actually help more than LEZs, or do you just think bus lanes are not as important as LEZs when it comes to keeping buses moving? No, I think both can help. So where are we doing more bus lanes and uh, well, the, within, the, within the legislation? The provisions within the bill are for the, uh, creating the legal, legal provisions for LEZs. Um, local authorities can implement the introduction of bus lanes at the present moment if they choose to do so. OK, and the, and, and the issue we heard, and maybe we'll just leave it when I've said this comment, is, is that 
local councillors sometimes object to putting in bus lanes in because it, it is difficult in their wards to get those bus lanes past the residents. But in the bigger scheme of things, it's, it's beneficial uh, to the movement of the buses. Now, Stuart is going to make uh, some questions, I think, on the next issue. Stuart. Uh, thank, th thank you very much. And I, and I want to uh, talk a, a wee bit about uh, smart cards. And the, the current landscape is quite complex. I actually have a special wallet to hold all my travel-related cards, separate from my main wallet, which I have to keep... You know, so I've got my ITSO standard okay. card for bus. I've got my ITSO standard card for rail. I've got my senior rail card that's dumb. There's nothing technology. And then, of course, I've got a payment card so I can pay for things. Uh, so... He's lost one card since it's, it's the last evidence session, but Stuart. Uh, well, in, indeed, I'd like to lose three more, convener, and get down to one card. Um, now, the ITSO standard is already widely used. Is, is that the way forward? Without getting, I could readily do this, but I think it wouldn't be useful to get too much into the technology. And just let me ask the second part, which is really related to it, which is the National Smart Ticketing Advisory Committee. Is that the way we're going to get to a destination? And how does the bill help us uh, actually do that and get to the comparatively simple environment for the customer uh, that we have in London? OK. So I think the challenge that we have in, uh, in Scotland is that we have such a wide range of transport service providers, um, uh, which uh, then creates challenges around how you can introduce a smart ticketing system which is also interoperable between different modes of transport and different operators. And that's been clearly one of the very significant challenges which we've had to date, despite the fact that we actually have some uh, operators who have already got smart ticketing arrangements in place, but they're not necessarily interoperable. So the provisions in the bill um, uh, are to uh, create powers uh, which allow us to specify what those national standards should actually be for any smart ticketing system that's been introduced by a transport provider. Uh, and that is uh, uh, on the basis of the guidance which is provided by the uh, National Advisory Board, which we're putting in statute, which will be responsible for looking at what should be the technological, what should be the technical standards which are set to ensure that any smart ticketing system that's been introduced by an operator is one which is interoperable with other service providers. Uh, and to advise ministers on that and for us to have the powers, um, along with local authorities, to be able to mandate that as a requirement uh, for those who are providing services. So the key thing is trying to get interoperability between these matters because of the complexity of the range of different organisations we have that deliver transport provision. But, but in a sense, Cabinet Secretary, uh, in London, they're essentially simply moving to, if you use the same payment card across the different modes in London, you actually don't need any special transport cards at all to get the best deal and to get the through ticketing. Um, now, I understand, of course, that it's because Transport for London gets all the financial transactions and therefore can, before presenting them to the bank, can deal with them and collate them across modes, are we actually talking to financial providers to see what scope there is for that uh, and, and, and making sure that that's the approach? Because un, until we kind of get that approach, we won't get the kind of benefits that the, 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 they're more or less moving away from the Oyster card because they don't need it anymore in London. And we are moving into a position where it sounds like we are a decade later, reinventing the Oyster card or the Scallop card or whatever we might choose to call it. It's not about, you're right, they are moving away from the Oyster card, and this is not about creating a new national Oyster card. This is about making sure that whichever smart ticketing arrangement a, a travel provider has in place is that it's interoperable, that you can use it for going from rail to ferry, from ferry to bus, uh, so that we have a a, a greater connectivity around these options for individuals. But do forgive me, Cameron, etc., and I'll make this the last bit, that given that the integration in London seems to work most effectively by looking at integrating the payments, are the government and will the committee be talking to payment providers to see what scope there is for uh, something that is similar? 
if not identical. So you, you, you are to some degree uh, uh, asking me to uh, preempt the work of the, the advisory board. That's exactly the type of area I would expect the advisory board to be exploring, to look at before they set what the national standards should actually be, what should be the key principles that drive it and what should be the national stance that we want them want to set. That then gives us the power to be able to actually make sure that's been applied across operators right across the country. So it's on the agenda. Thank you. Convener. Uh, Richard, I think yours is the next question. Cabinet yeah. Secretary, I was in London with my family a few months ago, so I went on the tube, I went on a bus, I went on the Emirates zip line, I went on, that was, a, that was interesting, I was on the Docklands Light, Light Railway because we stayed in the East End and we, and we took a boat and we had smart ticketing and it cost the same, the price was capped and, you know, and as I say we were on different things during the whole day. So. Several respondents, such as Getting Glasgow Moving, argue that smart ticketing alone is not enough, but there should be daily price caps across all public transport within a city region, as happens in London, as, I, as I've already said, uh, enabling by smart ticketing. How would you respond to such a suggestion? And did I not see last week you gave a million pounds to, um, to promote this uh, smart ticketing? Am I correct in saying that? I think I saw that in a paper or Twitter or whatever. Well, I don't know where you've seen it, but I would recall you're correct. Um, uh, part of that is to, uh, is to help to support um, smaller transport providers to be able to invest in the technology which is necessary to support smart ticketing um, as well. Um, uh, smart ticketing isn't the, isn't the, the, you know, the, 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 the magic answer to all of this uh, in, in, in resolving some of these issues, but it's an important element of it. And that issue of interoperability, just like you experienced in, in London, um, is where we want to actually get to, where there is greater interoperability between different service providers in itself. Uh, there's no provisions within the bill to actually uh, cap payments, uh, which you call our fares. Uh, there is provisions within the, the Bus Service Improvement Partnership, which allows local authorities and LTAs, when they're looking at introducing these, to deal with issues around uh, fares as well. Um, uh, but, it's a, uh, uh, but the issue of uh, interoperability is key to making sure we get more effective smart ticketing options. So, why do Scottish ministers need a power to direct local authorities to establish a smart ticketing scheme? So, uh, say for example, you were, when you were in London, if there was one of the operators just decided in a particular area to say, well, we're not going to do that, we want to go off and do our own thing, is that uh, we wouldn't be able to get that type of interoperability that uh, they have in some areas. So, the power is there to make sure that should there be a situation where there is a service provider or an LA decides we're just not going to participate in this, um, uh, maybe in a city region area like Glasgow, uh, that it allows us to be able to give direction on the basis of advice from the advisory board uh, about what that should be uh, to make sure that there's action taken in order to introduce a, a smart ticketing method which is interoperable with the rest of the system. Thank you. OK, the next question is from Jamie Green. Jamie. On my microphone. Thank you. That's okay. Um, I, before I move on to my question, can I follow on from Richard Law's questions? I think uh, some local authorities will be watching the session today and perhaps a little bit unclear as to where they stand after this. We've had lots of evidence from local authorities, uh, all with different views, understandably. Some are, are concerned about the administrative burdens of administering um, uh, uh, multi operator ticketing schemes, others are completely opposed to the idea that the government should have the power to, to um, establish uh, those schemes and their authorities, and that there are mixed views on it. Uh, is it the case, then, that all this bill does is give, you the, give government the a power to ensure that if such schemes are introduced, then they all follow the same standard? Or is it uh, the introduction of a power that means that all local authorities will have to sign up to the scheme? It's just a bit unclear at the moment. Uh, so the, um, uh, the uh, purpose behind the National Advisory Board is that they will set the national standards so that uh, uh, service providers, when they are purchasing a uh, smart ticketing option, it will need to comply with those national standards so that it's interoperable with the other systems. Um, uh, where there's a local authority where they don't have one in place, um, uh, the issue would be about working with the transport providers to get them to move in that direction. So the funding which Richard Lyle made reference to is to help to support those smaller 
uh, companies to be able to invest in smart ticketing options uh, to help to deliver their own services. So uh, it's not about just imposing it for the sake of it, it's about trying to create the national standards which are necessary once they are set, if they are not being addressed by local authorities in the way in which they should be, in, 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 in the delivery of these services, there's a power to be able to mandate them to do that. Okay, so that's that's clear. So there, there is a power in the bill that means that if local authorities choose not to go down the smart ticketing route in their local areas, you can force them to. Is that correct? Uh, the principal purpose is it's not... I, I would be surprised if there's any local authority area in Scotland that doesn't want to have a smart ticketing option. Uh, what it's more about is about making sure that the standards which are applied in the smart ticketing option which is operating in their area is one which is interoperable with other areas in the country. But standards are technical things. So standards are is what's going on behind the scenes in terms of the technology that's delivering the interoperability, that's, that's allowing for the transaction payments and, and so on. And this, the, the, these different, as you say, uh, operators speaking together through some sort of mutual ticketing system. But that's the back end bit. What I think may be confusing to folk is the front end bit, in the sense that if you go to, for example, North Ayrshire, they may have one type of scheme, but in Inverclyde, there may be others. And many of these services are working across authorities. Not every authority is within a partnership, uh, transport, transport partnership uh, and on a regional level either. So I guess that leads into my, my own question, which is why is, why is the government choosing to do it this way? In the sense that we're either leaving it up to um, individual operators to develop their own schemes, and some of them are developing, ScotRail, Stagecoach, etc. In other cases, we're looking for lo local authorities to do it. All we're asking them to do is follow a national standard, but they can still implement whatever schemes they wish, and that will be done to, to various degrees of success or otherwise. And why is government not taking the lead on this, as other countries have done, where they've said, look, we appreciate it's not going to be easy. There are in issues around having multiple operators that aren't always talking to each other. Um, but if we really wanted to, we could. Um, there's technology out there. There are companies that can help government do this. Why have you taken this approach that you're not, that there's, no simple, there's no appetite at government to be a top-down uh, process to rolling out some sort of national scheme? It, for the very reason we don't want to take a top-down approach to it, we want to take a, an approach which is, um, it recognises the progress that some operators have already made in smart ticketing options. But we want to make sure that it's interoperable uh, in different areas, across different areas. So if you go from Ayrshire uh, and you're going into Glasgow, which is obviously an SPT area, but if you're going across into the areas, that it should be a system where if you're going from one bus operator to the next, is that it's an interoperable system. You should be able to get a through ticket as well. If you're getting onto the train, is you're able to get a through ticket? And then if you're getting a ferry, then you're able to actually get a through ticket uh, for that purpose as well. So it's about trying to make sure that national the standards which are applied by any uh, service provider uh, within the country, that they are interoperable. They have a standard that allows people to be able to get that through ticket that they require across different modes of transport uh, in a way that uh, isn't available at the present moment. And that's exactly what the National Advisory Board will be responsible for looking at, is how should that be set out uh, and what should those national standards be? And then it allows operators to decide on whatever system they're going to purchase for that to, 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 to provide smart ticketing they can choose to purchase whatever one they want, so long as it meets those national standards and is interoperable with the rest of the country. But, I mean, as it stands at the moment, it seems very unlikely we'll ever get to the stage in Scotland where you could buy a single ticket or use a single card, an example that Mr Stevenson gave, that would allow you access uh, on a bus, a train, a ferry, a tram, uh, because of this disparate nature of transport, and that's unlikely to change any time soon. I suspect the reality is that in, uh, in the years ahead, the requirement for a card will actually disappear uh, anyway, because it's increasingly moving to contactless uh, services. So the idea of anchoring this on a card, in my view, would be like trying to do the Oyster card type thing. It's actually in decline. Um, it's um, it's about, about recognising how technology is moving on. Uh, and actually, you know, this uh, EPUS approach to things, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably going to become contactless um, uh, in the years ahead. And that's why we're trying to create a system that recognises that's where it's going. So, uh, and and uh, technology, uh, and my other question, which I've promised I'd look at this morning, is around uh, making sure that we don't leave anyone behind. Um, I appreciate the, the, the issue around contactless. I think that's a point we haven't made this morning, and that's that... that Yes, that may be the route of travel, uh, pardon the pun, that the cards are less important, but people using their bank cards or mobile phones, etc. But that doesn't really still provide any through ticketing in the true sense, because they may be 
using that card uh, or using that contactless payment for multiple journeys. Uh, there's no real, um, as you say, capping of, 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 a, of the through price or, or any, any joined up approach to it. So that's just the, the method of payment as opposed to the, 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 the method of, of ticketing. Um, how do we ensure that we don't leave anyone behind? I mean, not everyone is au fait with using, you know, Apple Pay or other types of mobile mm. technologies um, or ha is used to using contactless. Um, is there a worry that there may be a situation where there is a cashless society in public transport that, that does leave uh, LD people behind, for example? And how do we ensure that doesn't happen? So I think one of the things that, again, um, uh, for the advisory board to consider is the, is the need to make sure that there will also be an element where uh, there is a paper option. So the person that wants to pay by cash, that wants to be able to get their ticket, that they're able to do that. Um, uh, that will always have to be an option uh, in any system. Thank you. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of the questions on buses and smart ticketing. We'll briefly pause. I'd ask everyone to stay in their places uh, unless they're moving, which I think are the people at the other end of the table. So if we briefly pause to allow people to change. Thank you. We'll now move on to the second part of uh, this session, which is on low emission zones and parking. I'd like to welcome some new members to the panel. Uh, Stephen Thompson, Head of Air Quality, George Henry, Parking Policy Manager, Anne Cairns and Mag Magdalene Boyd, who are both solicitors. Uh, we have a series of questions, and the first question is going to be from Peter Chapman. Peter. Thank you, convener. Um, we're on to LEZs now, Cabinet Secretary, and you know my question is round about the effectiveness of LEZs because analysis shows that they are a, you know fairly limited in what they can do. Uh, EU-sponsored research into the effectiveness of LEZs across Northern and Central Europe concluded that annual particulate matter concentrations were reduced by between nothing and seven percent, with no effects observed in most LEZs. And a similar story for neither at the home in London. So my question is really, are you confident that LEZs will play an, a significant role in reducing air pollution levels in, in Scotland? Yeah, I do. Um, and I do that on the basis of, uh, that's on the, basis of um, uh, uh, the standards which will be set for LEZs. Um, uh, particularly for, for, for example, in Glasgow, for the, uh, uh, which is going to be the first LEZ in the, in the country, uh, uh, where the uh, standards will be set uh, for, uh, for petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, there's been a lot of work done around air pollution in, uh, over a number of years to address air pollution, to reduce it. Um, but there's still issues about air quality uh, in some of our uh, town centres. So um, my view is that LEZs can help to address uh, some of these issues by the standards which are set uh, uh, around um, uh, vehicle emission levels uh, to help to improve uh, air quality in our town centres. So does that mean that you, you uh, see standards being tighter in Scotland than they've been in, in, uh, elsewhere in Northern Europe, given that they, they have found very little uh, impact of, of LEZs across Northern Europe? And even London, where you know, uh, the, the vast bulk of people are, are, obey the rules, but even there, there has been minimal uh, reduced reductions in, in particular matter. The system in London was a different one from the system that's going to operate in Scotland. It's almost like a road charging process that they have in London as opposed to a, a penalty charge process that we will actually have. Um, uh, uh, so there's a difference in that. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not about just doing... It's not about 
this is the one thing that will help to improve everything. There's a variety of different things that will improve air quality and address it. And low emission zones, I think, can actually help to uh, create some of the cultural shift uh, that's necessary to help to address some of these issues. So um, it's part of a wider package of measures. I think low emission zones can play an important part mm -hmm. uh, in helping to address uh, air pollution, air quality issues in our town centres. OK, um, the second question, you've really touched on it already. The, 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 the bill proposed in, in the north of the border is that certain classes of vehicle will be banned from entering an LEZ, and LEZ with a penalty imposed for non-compliance. Many other, other LEZs, for example, in London, require a charge to be paid if the entry criteria are not met. So there is a difference there, as you rightly say. So um, the committee has heard calls for the London approach to be adopted in Scotland. So what is your view on that? They've taken a the London approach is a, a road, almost a road charging approach to it, whereas our view is that it's about uh, preventing vehicles of a certain type uh, going into our town centres, and if they do go in, then they face a, a fixed penalty as a result of that. Um, uh, so it's a, a different approach to it, and uh, our view is that this is a more effective approach in helping to address issues around vehicles. Uh, uh, the pollution levels that come from vehicles in itself and the, the standards which will be set for what those vehicles that are allowed into the zone will be are about trying to help to um, uh, help to improve air quality in our town centres. So um, I think it's a more effective measure where we're actually saying there are certain vehicles that we don't expect to be in our town centre because of the level of pollution that they actually cause, rather than actually having a charging regime that charges them on the basis of the level of pollution that they cause to the area. Okay, thank you. He wants to come in. Um, I just wondered if uh, the Minister and his officials have looked at the experience uh, in Beijing uh, when they more or less banned anything that was polluting. This included industry, so it wasn't just transport, uh, for the Olympics. And in a single year, they saw a 46% reduction in attendances at hospitals for asthma and a 23 gram average rise in live birth weights um, as indicators of the beneficial effects of getting pollutants out of their atmosphere. And I just wondered if, the, rather than just simply look at European examples, officials and the minister are looking uh, at wider examples that might inform uh, policy in this area. I know that officials have looked at a wide range of international experience. I don't know if they looked specifically at the, uh, uh, a temporary provision which was put in place in Beijing, it should be said, um, uh, 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 specifically. Uh, but I think your point around how uh, uh, air quality can have an impact on individuals' health should not be underestimated. And part of the purpose behind LEZs is to to try to address some of the congestion issues and uh, address a, a number of other issues around air quality in itself, but also to address the health issues which are associated uh, with it. And in my view, LEZs can help to address that. Um, I, I, Cabinet Secretary, I, I'd quite like to just ask you a question on buses, if I may. Um, certainly, we heard evidence during the evidence session that uh, it, making a bus a Euro 6 compliant from a Euro 5 compliant um, is difficult, but, but can cost in the region of £20,000. What we also heard during the evidence session that uh, if the, a Euro 5 bus was moving briskly along the route it should be moving along, the actual energy, uh, sorry, the emissions from the bus were, were no worse than a Euro 6 bus. So there was some evidence to suggest that we should be moving things along routes better, which goes to an earlier question I asked about keeping things moving in bus lanes. So do you subscribe to that view or do you think bus operators are wrong when they're saying that, that the Euro 6 designation on buses will only have a marginal effect and a better effect would be to keep buses moving uh, in bus lanes quickly along routes? I think it's a combination of both. Um, uh, uh, bus uh, engines which are more efficient uh, and emit less emissions. Uh, alongside um, uh, uh, improving uh, bus journey times uh, to reduce the time when they're sitting around idling, etc., uh, and the impact that can have on uh, uh, on air pollution. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a combination of both. So there'll be a huge cost involved to these uh, bus operators because when we were in Glasgow, we saw some buses that were still uh, Euro 4 models because uh, they 
we were explained it was written on the back of them so you could identify immediately whether they were four, five or six. And there's a huge amount of buses which will completely be taken out of the loop of use, which may actually limit bus use in Glasgow even more. Is that, is that the objective? So um, part of the... Uh, we recognise there is a cost for bus operators in moving to the Euro 6 standard, which we'll, we'll, we'll set out in further detail with the regulation. Um, the... Uh, uh, that's why we've provided almost £8 million in uh, the bus emissions uh, abatement programme, which uh, helps to support bus service providers to introduce retrofit uh, kits onto their existing non-Euro uh, 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 6 buses to reduce emissions on them to the Euro 6 level. So we're providing funding to help to support them in doing that. You'll also be aware that there is a um, uh, there is a grace period uh, within uh, the provisions for uh, for low emission zones, and that is to help to work with the bus industry around the timeline for them and actually the, the transition they would have for their for their fleet as well. So uh, it gives local authorities the flexibility to to work with the industry to try and give them time to uh, to carry out the changes that they need to their fleet. So a combination of the money which we're giving them. And also, I think the grace period gives them an opportunity to start taking forward those measures. OK, so just a brief question. Is the funding that the Scottish Government giving to bus companies in Scotland the same as the funding that is being given to bus companies in the UK for, for the retrofit, or is there a difference? Uh, there, is a, there is a difference to it, and actually, uh, I, I believe... Um, I can come back specifically to the committee on that in writing, but there's a difference to the provision which we are making which makes it more generous than that in England and Wales. I'm sure the bus companies will look forward to hearing that because that's not what they said in the evidence session. Uh, but we look forward to receiving that letter. Uh, the next question is from John Mason. Hey, thanks, convener. I mean, to build on what the convener's just been asking, but to leave aside the buses, if we think about other vehicles, um, I mean, clearly cars and, and other vehicles generally are lasting longer than they used to. My own car is nine years old. Um, and especially people from a lower income bracket will not be replacing cars so often, will tend to be using second-hand ones. Is there a danger that some of them would be disadvantaged by the LEZ if they can't take their vehicles into the city centre? And I'm thinking particularly, you know, maybe somebody who's starting off as a joiner or an electrician or something will have an older vehicle but really needs it for his work. Yeah, well, your, your vehicle is much more modern than mine. Mine is 14 years old. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at the... If you look at the, uh, uh, the Euro 4 for petrol cars, that would roughly take you to a car which is a 2004 plate, uh, which is 14 years old. Um, uh, which, if you, it's the same for a, a Euro 6, uh, which again would be about a 2004 plate. So I recognise there are uh, potential risks there for individuals in lower income. Um, however, I think that standard gives people an opportunity that if they are looking at a car, that there's a significant second-hand car market within that area that would actually comply with the Euro 6 or the Euro 4 standards mm -hmm. um, uh, as well. So um, uh, I think we've got to be alive to that, but I do think that the regulation to bring forward will help to try and accommodate that potential risk. Right, and you've already mentioned grace periods, which I think are to cover this kind of area. Now, and, and frankly, we've had conflicting evidence in the committee um, in that some people think they're far too long and we should be much, if we're serious about the air quality, we need to be much more aggressive. And then others have said, no, there's a real cost to this. You've got to give us time. Uh, we don't want to damage business, so they should be even longer. C could you just explain briefly why you've come to the grace periods that you have come to? So the grace periods give them uh, give the local authority the options. So from a one-year grace period through to a four-year grace period uh, for non-residential based uh, 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 individuals within the LEZ area to allow them to make the transition that is necessary. Whether they go for a two-year grace period, a three-year grace period or a four-year grace period is for the local authority to decide upon based on their own local consultation uh, and introducing the LEZ uh, as well. But of course, there is also an, a further extended um, uh, grace period for those who are residents within uh, these particular areas, which goes to six years. Uh, it's a six-year grace period that the local authority can go as far as uh, in order to allow them to make the transition that may be necessary as well. So it's recognising there's time that we need for businesses um, to allow them to make the transition, but it's a local authority that will decide upon what that is, and also for local residents, and it will be the local authority that will decide upon that as well. 
Okay, thanks. And finally, um, I mean, I've, I've got a heritage bus museum in my constituency, and they're worried that they won't be allowed to drive their old buses around. Is there provision for a kind of exemption to be made for, for that kind of situation, for a particular day, perhaps? So there, there are, uh, there are, um, uh, uh, there is provision for exemptions, and they'll be dealt with through regulations, so that we can adapt them uh, uh, to particular circumstances. So there'll be an opportunity through the consultation for organisations like the one in your constituency to highlight the need to provide certain exemptions for particular purposes. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify that, so I understand it. My understanding that in the legislation is it was purely for days of importance that are recognised uh, by local authorities for those vehicles to drive around. But if you have an old, as, as many people do, car, heritage car that they want to take for a drive, they'll be precluded on a normal day from taking it anywhere near an LEZ, is that right? So we've got a qualifying requirement around it being a, a significant day. Um, I want to look to see where we extend that. So, for example, I'm conscious that, uh, you know, it could be, uh, it could be a... a it could be a funeral car uh, that we have to go, or a, a wedding vehicle that uh, requires exemptions for the purposes of it as well. So I want to look at whether that's framed in a way that gives us the necessary flexibility it's required in certain circumstances. But I think uh, it, the idea of suspending LEZs for particular periods it could be linked very much to it. It would have to be an, day of, an issue of national importance. So. It could be a national sporting event that's taking place within the town centre and they want to suspend it for that purpose um, uh, because of vehicles that will be brought in to support that event. But there is also exemptions around individual vehicles for particular purposes while the LEZ is still operating. So, I mean, I think the concern that's been raised to me, and, and, and you'll know, Cabinet Secretary, that in my register of interest that I have a farming interest, that people coming out, uh, coming in from the countryside to, to cities will probably be using their, their agricultural type pickups that they won't necessarily change every 10 years. They'll be banned from coming into, into places such as Glasgow if it's, it's a Euro 6, because anything built prior to 2014 will, will not be able to get in there. And that's a real issue uh, to some people who live in the countryside. Do you, do you think that's right? For, for diesel, it would be 2004. 2014, it, anything for, built before 2014 for diesel, is Euro 5, not yeah. Euro sorry. 6. Uh, they, they would be, they would they face a penalty if they were using a vehicle within the LEZ area that was over that limit, yes. That's quite hard on a, 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 a lot of people who probably rely on those vehicles for their normal work process, because they're not going to change them every 10 years. And I just ask if it's possible to reflect on that. Well, there, there is, there's no need to at this present time because there will be a consultation in the regulations which will deal with these matters. So for those bodies that have an interest in making representations in these issues, they'll be able to in, engage in the, the, the regulation-making process to consider these issues. OK, Jamie Green and then Maureen. Thanks. Governor Secretary, can I ask for your uh, brief comment on two things specifically? One is displacement and it concerns around that. Uh, is it the case that businesses, including smaller bus companies will just simply put on all their modern ve ve uh, vessels into the LEZs, but then peripheral areas outside of the LEZs will suffer from the old uses of older vehicles. And secondly, uh, the cost of upgrading to Euro 6 uh, uh, vehicles for bus companies is going to be quite substantial. First Glasgow said over £100 million. McGill's have just ordered 26 new buses and so on. Will any of these costs be passed on to passengers, do you think? Well, dealing with, um, uh, dealing with the first part um, of your question is that very often buses which will be coming into LEZs will be coming from suburban areas. So they'll be coming into the town centre and probably passing through it. Um, at the moment, some that isn't the case, but for many in cities, they come in through the town centre and go elsewhere. So, um, uh, so they'll have to comply in that sense. There is also the possibility, though, and I wouldn't dispute this, is that there's a possibility that they would displace some of the buses that they can no longer use in town centres into using, that have got an LEZ in place, to use them elsewhere um, in moving their fleet. Um, uh, so that is possible, but by and large, most buses that you know I've used go into the town centre and then go into somewhere else from uh, from the town centre. Uh, in terms of passing on, uh, the, 
part of the idea behind the grace period and also the uh, retrofit abatement programme, which we're supporting for the bus industry, is to help to support them to meet some of these costs, but also the grace period to try and help to uh, absorb some of the natural turnover they would have in their fleet in renewing their buses anyway, uh, so that they can upgrade them, but so they're at the standards when they purchase them. So when I was in Alexander Dennis's just last week, there was loading buses were doing that. Um, uh, and I know some of the bus operators are already doing that. So um, some of them will manage it as part of the turnover of their fleet uh, to make sure they comply with the LEZs. No cost to passengers? Uh, well, it will be down to them as a company to decide on how they choose to uh, meet the cost. They, they over, you know, bus, as you know, bus companies have a, a programme on how they want to turn over their fleet uh, as well, and they will manage that in the overall cost base of running their business. Uh, whether uh, it is going to drive up costs purely because having to purchase business, buses for LEZs coming in, uh, I have not saw any evidence of that. Uh, Secretary, we have talked a lot about um, grace periods at the front, will there not come a time where LEZs will be redundant because we're, well, we will all have low emission vehicles instead or electric cars and there will be, because of climate change legislation, lots more uh, active travel within LEZs <laughs> in these city centres. So can you foresee a situation, I don't know, 20 years hence where there will be no need for LEZs? Yeah, that may be the case. Uh, but I think they've got an important part to play just now in helping to create some of that culture shift and some of that transition. So um, it could be that in the next 10, 15, 20 years is that the requirement for LEZs are no longer necessary. Thank you. OK, and the next question is Peter Chapman. Yeah, I mean, local authorities, as we understand, will have some flexibility in how they introduce LEZs. Um, so we, we have heard concerns from fleet operators in particular that you know different rules applying to different LEZs could make it very confusing for drivers and difficult for fleet operators to, to plan their routes. So what reassurance can you offer to such operators that these problems are being thought about and, and that there's a way forward? Well, I, I, th I think you raise an important issue because uh, uh, the objective is obviously by 2020 is for our four main cities to actually have LEZs in place, um, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Aberdeen. Uh, and what I want to be is in a position where um, a, a van that goes from Glasgow to Dundee, if there's LEZs in both, is that that van, if it complies with it in Glasgow, it complies with it in Dundee. So we'll deal with that through regulation. So there is a, a consistency of approach um, across the country on the standards which are set for LEZs. I know there were some questions about should that not be in the face of the bill. The reason we're putting it in regulations is because it allows us to then uh, change and adapt these as circumstances change. So as uh, engines move on, etc., we can then come uh, with due parliamentary scrutiny, but it allows us to flex the change without having to resort to um, uh, legislative change as such. Um, but the point you make is one that I fully recognise and uh, we'll be seeking to address that through uh, the regulations. OK, thank you. Uh, John. Uh, I'd plan to ask you a question about the financial memorandum, Cabinet Secretary. It was in part touched on earlier, but something, I mean, people talk about the inconvenience, the, the mechanics of it all, grace periods, the costs. Thus far, no one's mentioned uh, the number of lives that, uh, uh, where deaths are directly attributable to poor air quality. Now, uh, is 40,000 UK is the figure that's normally used, the Royal College of Physicians, and the Conservative estimate for Scotland is 2,500 lives are lost each year directly attributable to air quality. What projection has been done in respect of this legislation about the outstanding benefits of um, lives that can be... Uh, saved from I, this legislation? I, I can't give you a specific figure on that in terms of how LEZ the number of lives it will potentially save. Is that what you're driving at? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't give you a figure for that. Is that not peculiar, though? Because, um, you know, we talk about the minutiae of all sorts of things. Um, and this is fundamental. This is absolutely fundamental uh, that surely... Um, and. Uh, Mr Stevenson touched on it earlier there and, uh, with his comments about uh, um, respiratory ailments and the temporary period in Beijing where the, the, there was an imposition of that. Is that some work that could be done, please? More than happy for us to look at that to see <coughs> if there is some further information we could provide um, around that. Um, but uh, I don't believe there's been any specific modelling that's been carried out. Do you want to say? 
Yeah, I could add a, a small bit to that. Actually, Health Protection Scotland are meeting today to look at the feasibility of looking at the impact of LEZs. So to determine whether it's actually feasible to say that an LEZ has an impact that's measurable to the LEZ in addition to all the other aspects of, of air pollution mitigation. So that's what Health Protection Scotland are looking at right now. Well, that, that's reassuring, and, and hopefully the committee can hear back back from that. And it t takes me into my earlier point about the, the uh, government policies coming together, because surely, if, if, if in the term preventative spend, which I prefer to think about people rather than machines, surely that's an important element of this that should be considered. So, any information you could provide on that would be welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll uh, convene. We'll come back to the committee with some further information around the, what the Health Protection Scotland are doing around that. Thank you very much indeed. OK. Um, sorry, John. I think you also wanted to uh, ask a question on the uh, costs associated with y Yes, in indeed. I, I felt it was in part touched on earlier, but there there there's been criticism uh, shared with the, the Finance Committee, um, Cabinet Secretary, um, and, and it is about uh, the financial memorandum and, and a view that it significantly understated uh, the, the costs associated, associated with it. So what's your response to that? And can you clarify what proportion of these costs as regards LEZ will be met by the Scottish Government and local authorities respectively, please? I, th I think the challenge <coughs> in trying to give a, 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 as accurate a, pit, a figure as possible is the different ways in which LEZs could operate in different local authoritarians. Um, and what we've sought to do is use data that we've got from both Edinburgh and I think Aberdeen as well to try to help to inform the financial memorandum around the potential cost for introducing LEZs. Um, uh, so that my view is that the figures which we've provided are as accurate as we can, but there, is, um, uh, uh, there are some challenges around being able to be as accurate as we would like to be because of the way in which we could operate in Dundee will be different from Glasgow and the size and the area which it could cover as well, um, uh, which makes it more challenging for us to be able to be very specific on what the final cost would actually be. OK, if I may revert back a little bit uh, there, um, the number of deaths, the, the Conservative figure uh, attributed to uh, is 2,500. That's... Uh, ten times the number of deaths associated with road traffic accidents. I understand the Scottish Government would put a figure on the cost of a life killed in a road traffic accident, a seven-figure sum. So, um, again, I, I think there's more work could and should be done in relation to this and, and the costs on humans as well as simply infrastructure. OK. Thank Happy you. to take that away and look at that. Thank you. Sure. Certainly on that, the evidence we heard at the Committee of, of establishing uh, the congestion charge in London was extremely expensive and the only reason that they could then superimpose uh, LEZs on top of it is because they'd already paid for the cameras through the congestion charge and there was no way of doing it in Scotland. And there was a considerable concern that the costs of establishing LEZs had been underestimated. So would it be possible also for you to revert back to the committee on, on the methodology used for that? Yeah, I can. Of course, I'd be more than happy to provide what further information we can. Thank you. Um, Mike, yours is the next question. Convener, <clears throat> I mean, now we turn to the, is, uh, the uh, issues of pavement parking and um, the exceptions to pav parking prohibitions. So under section 47, I think I want to focus on subsection 6. I mean, all the other subsections in this, there are, there are 10 which give exemptions nationally, and I think they're very good. Um, but the evidence that we've heard from the committee is focusing on subsection 6, that is the parking prohibitions do not apply where motor vehicles in the course of business, loading and unloading, but the vehicle is so parked for no longer than is necessary for the delivery, collection, loading or unloading, and in any event for no more than a continuous period of 20 minutes. This has caused some problems because the bill with that subsection gives a national uh, exemption to allow firms to uh, deliveries to park on pavements, where at the moment driving and parking on pavements is illegal, but this is actually giving them the permission to do it. And the evidence that we've received is that this would be totally um, unenforceable. This exemption would be totally unenforceable, uh, this 20-minute exemption. And in the bill itself, there's an argument that subsection 6 is not needed because the bill already allows local authorities to exempt such streets uh, from the pavement parking prohibition. So in local areas where local authorities can see there's a particular problem for deliveries, they can exempt it under this bill. But what you're doing is, I think, is unintended, 
I think it's an unintended consequence of this with Section 6, putting a national uh, exemption in for this sends the wrong signal. So at the moment, all the controversy has been in, uh, about the, the motivation has been to, to free up off pavements to people who particularly are uh, annoyed because they're blocked with whether they are disabled or whether they're young mums or young dads or young carers or other carers with prams and that sort of thing. The real worry is the unintended consequences of subsection 6. Um, and I recognise the, the, the issue that the members have raised, and um, I've received from representation uh, in this matter myself. Um, it is worth pointing out that the, um, the, it, it remains a criminal offence um, for a, a HGV or a lorry to, uh, to park on a pavement. That, notwithstanding what there's in this bill, that remains a criminal offence. Uh, what we're trying to achieve here, though, is a, a balance between those uh, smaller vans uh, that may be carrying out a delivery or picking up is to, and to do so, they require to park in the pavement, not completely because they can't obstruct the whole of the pavement, but to use part of the pavement uh, for a short period of time in order to carry out that delivery or to, or to pick up the goods, um, where uh, it wouldn't be reasonably able to do it by parking elsewhere. So... What we're trying to achieve here is the objective that you set out in terms of um, improving access for those who may have uh, mobility issues with prams, uh, visual issues, etc., um, uh, to uh, take away the potential uh, hazards that they could face, but at the same time also recognising that there will be instances where um, it may be the only option that the driver of the van or the vehicle has uh, in order to pick up something or to drop something off, that there's a, a level of time that they've got in order to uh, to carry that out. So uh, I'm, I, I'm always minded at looking to see whether there's ways in which we can improve the legislation. Uh, but I hope the committee would recognise that we're trying to strike a balance here in a way that delivers what we're trying to achieve, but at the same time recognises for businesses there may be some practical challenges that they could come across. I understand entirely the issue of trying to strike a balance. What I'm trying to get across <laughs> is that with subsection 6, in attempting to strike the balance, you're actually reversing uh, the law, because the law at the moment doesn't allow people to drive onto, onto pavements to unload. It is illegal to drive onto, onto pavements now. What this bill does is allow that to happen. So, in fact, from, from the motivation which you have is to free up access for all these people that we've discussed. The act, this, is a, this might be in, ineffective legislation. This, so, this one subsection might be ineffective legislation. And my point is, if you've already got in the bill, and you, you're talking about not ha wanting to have a top-down approach, but understand in, in your other questions about local authorities, local authorities surely would be the best place to know their own their own roads and where there's a real problem and, and then you're giving, you're giving them already the, the ability to exempt those areas. I'm just asking, could you really look at subsection 6 and stage 2 because I would rather prefer the government came forward at stage 2 and looked at this again? Look, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to look at it again to, to see whether we've got the balance right and if there are potentially some unintended consequences that the member made reference to that uh, that we could address. So um, uh, let me take that away and let's have a look at it and um, if there is a way in which we can uh, help to address some of these concerns or possibly provide greater clarity around it, I'm more than happy to do that. One, one small point. From, uh, ever, we had a, a question from other witnesses. Um, when it says the regulations are um, prohibiting parking on pavements, was there, there was a question about does that include cycleways as well? Um, you cover that, George? Yes, I can. Um, do you mean as in a cycle lane on the carriageway? Yeah, cycle, um, cycle lane. Local authorities, all, you know, cycle tracks could be all segregated with a shared space with footway as well, so that was why I wanted to clarify that matter. Um, cycle lanes, local authorities already have the powers to make them mandatory, um, so they can promote a traffic regulation order, which would mean that you cannot stop on a cycle lane or, or, um, or park. Um, however, it, it all determines how local authorities wish to take that forward. Many actually install advisory lanes, um, so cycle lanes as such are not covered in the, um, in the bill as it stands. Not covered, OK. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, on a slightly wider issue of pave, parking the pavements, um, I have a considerable number of streets in my constituency where the road is relatively narrow and the pavement is relatively wide. 
and what I consider considerate drivers, and I do it myself, is to put two wheels on the pavement, which allows plenty of room for someone to pass on the pavement, um, but keeps the road clear for buses, bin lorries and larger vehicles. Um, so I've got a slight problem with this idea of just a total ban, and I suspect councils are going to find too much hassle and too much cost in exempting streets, so they won't do that. So I just wonder if there's not an unintended consequence that um, some places where it would be perfectly reasonable to put two wheels on the pavement uh, to prevent blockages on the road are going to just create a, a problem on the roads. Okay. So there is, um, uh, the intention of the bill is not just to have the blanket ban without the ability to have some areas where there may be exceptions, uh, where there uh, may be narrow roads, uh, but with, uh, with wide, uh, uh, wide uh, pedestrian ways uh, as well. So uh, uh, there is scope within the bill for local authorities in areas that they've identified uh, to apply an exemption, so long as uh, the actual passenger area, uh, passenger uh, pathway, is at least 1.5 metres um, in size, uh, where they can apply exemptions. But it will be for individual local authorities to identify the areas within their own respective areas as to where they believe that should be applied, depending on the circumstances. W would it not be simpler, both for the legislation and for the local authorities' point of view, and cheaper, just to say? You've got to leave, uh, assuming the pavement is more than 1.5 metres, uh, you've got to leave 1.5 metres clear. If it's less than one, you've got to leave the whole thing clear. Would that not be simpler legislation? Then the councils wouldn't have any costs uh, and they would just have to enforce it as they would normally. So, so th as it stands, the, 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 the provision will actually provide for an exemption which local authorities can apply based upon local need and local circumstances. Sorry? There'll be a cost to that, won't there? Yeah, but if, they were to, if you were to flip it round and you were to make them to apply this in areas uh, uh, where they want, uh, where there were no exemptions being provided, there would be a cost involved in that for them as well. But if you said 1.5 metres in the legislation, there'd be no cost. Well, the, we, we can look to see whether that can be dealt with in the legislation or whether actually it can be dealt with just through a, a regulation or through the guidance that makes it very clear for them that accompanies the bill. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it needs to be in the face of the bill itself, though. Okay. Okay. Jamie and then uh, Richard Lau. Th thanks, Convener. Just following on this very interesting uh, line of question. Uh, first of all, can I say I have some sympathy with the Cabinet Secretary's uh, view on the temporary exclusions. Uh, I think it's imperative that we allow <coughs> businesses to go about their, their normal business, but still implement the, the policy intentions of the bill. So. I think you'll find uh, some sympathy from, from me on that. But on this issue of, of parking, I think there's a, a very low level of understanding of what's coming down the road here with this, in the sense that if, if this is introduced as, as planned, there'll be a, uh, a blanket pavement uh, ban on two-wheel pavement parking. And I think if you actually, when you actually go around uh, constituencies and regions, you realise how much of it takes place. Um, and my problem with this is around there's absolutely nothing in the bill which will help local authorities deal with those traffic issues. Where will people park is the question I'm being asked. Where else can we park? There is nowhere else to park. There's nothing in here really to offer any assistance to local authorities other than apply for exemptions under rules that you've dictated to them nationally. I, I just don't see any real long-term solution to the problem here. So, um, to try and address some of these issues, we've already got uh, engagement with local authorities. A uh, meeting yesterday, I think, uh, that took place with, in, sorry, on Monday. on Monday, which took uh, took place with local authorities to look at managing some of these issues, which can then be addressed through the guidance that accompanies the bill uh, to help to support them. So, I recognise that there'll be some local authorities where it will be a greater challenge than others. Um, I'm thinking. In particularly in places like Glasgow and Edinburgh, where you've got tenements and some of the streets are narrower and the pavements are more limited, but you know you may have a four or five storey tenement there, so I and everybody in that uh, block's got a, a car as well. So there will be areas where there will be specific challenges, and part of the work we're doing with local authorities is to look at how we can make sure that we've got the necessary guidance for them so they know where they actually have to apply the exemptions where it's appropriate. Um, well, at the same time, making it very clear that where it can be applied is that this is what the standard rule should now be and not be able to park on the pavement. Mm. As you say, I mean, there are tenements with maybe six, sometimes more cars in a single block and only two spaces outside it. <clears throat> um, these cars aren't, aren't going to disappear when the legislation comes in. And if there are no other parking provisions made available, 
and more importantly, <clears throat> no additional funding made available to support local authorities. Again, not asking that the central government starts building car parks everywhere, but there is a real issue at stake here, and that's the cars aren't disappearing, but they've got nowhere to go. So I'm, I'm not convinced that we're, we are really addressing the root, root cause of the problem. Well, part of the idea is to try and help to provide local authorities with the powers to be able to take these things into account in the areas where they're going to apply exemptions. And these are the types of issues that they would have to consider in making an assessment and determining where they are going to apply an exemption in a particular area. OK. Uh, Richard. Yeah, I think following on uh, Jamie Green's point, you know, that there has to be common sense in this because there are some areas where if both um, sides of the road are, are, are filled with cars and they're not parking on the pavement uh, and, and they're parking as legally they should now when this bill comes in, I don't think a fire engine, emergency services may, may get through. I can think of some interesting roads in Glasgow. I can think of some interesting roads in, in other areas. So, um, but I'll, I'll park that one. Park that one. Um, I, th I think we got it, Rich. Yeah, good. I, I, I hoped you had. Um, pedestrian area. There are pedestrian areas in Glasgow, Edinburgh, some towns that shops are on. You know, I can think of quite a number if you want to go out and, and shop. And quite interestingly, um, you're walking along and a, a van comes along at nine o'clock in the morning because they're delivering to uh, a particular shop that doesn't have a back shop and they deliver from the front access. So, contrary, and, and it's an alternative to what Mike was saying, and I, I actually agree with what Mike uh, Rumbles was on about. Um, but basically, a question I want to ask you is, what reassurance can you offer to delivery firms and businesses that the pavement and double parking prohibitions will not unduly affect their operation? And will the par parking standards document currently under development offer any clarity on this issue? Because many companies are going to turn around and say, well, where do we, how do we deliver to a, a shop in the middle of Glasgow shopping centre? So the, um, uh, the document will, will engage uh, with the uh, stakeholders as part of the consultation around that, and that will also involve those in the industry who have got a view around what the parking standards should actually be. Uh, uh, but it should help to give clarity uh, as to what those... Well, will give clarity to what those standards uh, will be. Um, and on your first point, um, I would echo the, what I said to Mike Rumbles, and that is that we're trying to strike a balance here. Uh, between um, uh, freeing up access on paths uh, uh, to uh, remove obstructions, while well, at the same time recognising that there are individuals going about the legitimate business. It's not just about delivering something. There's also an issue around, which we shouldn't uh, lose sight of, is that there are, uh, there are health and safety challenges here for folk that are carrying out deliveries. Is that the vehicle has to be parked much further away, sort of idea, the risks to them as well. So there's a balance that we're trying to strike here. If there are ways in which we can try and help to address some of the concerns that people have around that, I'm open to looking at that and we'll take that away to see if there are things we can do. But there are, uh, there are balances that we have to try and achieve. OK, thank you. Hey, uh, Colin, you wanted to come in for a move to Maureen. Can I just touch on the issue around enforcement? My understanding of the bill is, is a local authority um, has the power to take enforcement action where there's been a, a contravention of the, the pavement parking or, or double parking prohibition. But does that mean that where parking hasn't been decriminalised, a council enforcement officer will be able to put a parking ticket on somebody parking on the pavement, but they won't be able to put a parking ticket on a car next to it parked on double yellow lines? Um, if, it's in a, it's right, if it's in an area where they have not decriminalised uh, parking, it would be a matter for the police uh, to enforce. So, wait, George, maybe just to take you through that and how that will operate. Yeah, at the moment, that's the way it stands. Um, however, this bill will provide uh, powers for, for all local authorities to carry out enforcement. We are continuing to work with stakeholders um, to discuss enforcement, to get consistency right across this country. There are some local authorities which do not have decriminalised parking enforcement, but they do have off-street car parks, which they have parking attendants for, so they may use them. And we are looking at uh, whether authorities can share services from neighbouring authorities as well. So the work's ongoing with that. As we speak. But just to be clear, though, that, that under the bill, where it isn't decriminalised, it, it seems to be implying that the local authority will be able to put a parking ticket on a car parked on a pavement, because it's specifically mentioned in the bill, but the car next to it on WR lines, at the moment, they wouldn't be able to put a parking ticket on that unless they go through the whole decriminalisation process. 
That's correct, does it stand, yeah. So are we not then missing a trick then? Why, why are we not using the bill to either completely decriminalise parking? Um, because since traffic warrants were, were scrapped by, by Police Scotland, which my view is short-sighted uh, decision, but since that's happened, more and more local authorities are moving towards decriminalisation. But that process is, is very lengthy. Uh, it's actually very expensive. It actually means we have to bring legislation before this parliament for every individual local authority. SSIs require to come before this committee and parliament. It's a very, very bureaucratic, lengthy process. Shouldn't we be using this bill simply to, at the very least, um, simplify that process? A single line that says if a local authority wants to decriminalise, we can do it like that, instead of having to go through the current very bureaucratic process. Or should we not just completely decriminalise altogether? Because you will have a two-tier system under this bill for pavement parking and other parking offences where it's not decriminalised at the moment. So you're right in terms of the, the, some of the bureaucracy around the decriminalisation uh, process. Um, um, uh, what I'll do is I'll take away the point the members raised and give consideration to that to see whether there is a, uh, if there is a way in which we could try and to use the bill as it stands at the present moment to simplify that process or to improve that process. I don't know whether that would be possible within the bill, but I'm certainly uh, more than happy to take that away and look at it and to engage with our colleagues at COSLA around um, uh, well, there is a way in which we could do it as well. Thank you. Uh, Maureen. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think the majority of witnesses that we had were supportive of the proposals on uh, pavement parking uh, and double parking. But one thing um, that has come up is about parking in front of dropped kerbs. And I have um, a constituency, in, in a number of constituents, uh, who we've gone out with the local authority to see what um, can be done, and there is a public petition in this matter. So, uh, is it possible um, that we can, in this bill, um, or is indeed needed in this bill, to have double yellow lines in front of um, dropped kerbs? Because we have an increasingly elderly uh, population, and I think if we're going to be talking about inclusivity and making sure that everybody can play their full part in society. It really doesn't happen if inconsiderate people are parking in front of drop curbs. I, look, I fully sympathise and recognise the challenges that people have uh, when uh, uh, individuals uh, park in front of drop curbs and uh, uh, the additional risk that that then causes for individuals uh, who may have to take an alternative route. Um, where well, there isn't a drop curb uh, in order to uh, to make uh, crossing road, there are, were some challenges around definitions of drop curbs, etc., which uh, technical def challenges which we had. Uh, but officials have been working on this uh, to look at where there's provision that we can make within the bill to give. Uh, greater certainty around these matters, and uh, George can maybe just explain a bit further about the work we've been taking forward on this front. Yeah, I mean, um, I think Jamie Green had, had raised about displacement and it had been mentioned with, with LEZs and, and parking. Um, actually, um, you know, domestic driveways um, is, was something that was considered um, when we've been discussing this with stakeholders. Um, the Scottish Government actually received powers uh, via the Scotland Act 2016 um, to legislate on parking at drop curbs. Um, however, we are aware that stakeholders um, have expressed concerns about drop curbs not being covered you know, on, on kind of the face of the bill. Uh, we have been considering what drop curbs um, should be included, and we are addressing these issues with stakeholders. And that's, to, that's basically whether it's a known crossing point that should, you know, fundamentally be a national ban. Nobody should park over a drop curb, which is a known crossing point. However, um, the domestic driveway would have obviously quite um, big impacts on, on displacement of vehicles. And these are the types of things that we, we are um, obviously discussing with stakeholders at the moment. I don't think it should be too difficult. I mean, I think most people know the distinction between somebody's drop curb in front of their driveway to get their own car in um, and something that's near a crossing or um, near shop, a shopping centre. I mean, you know, we would expect most people not to park in front of a drop curb, but that's not happening, unfortunately. And I think there needs to be some legislation. I fully accept that. that people should understand that. 
Mm. But as I'm sure the member will recognise, is that some people don't understand that but, and recognise that. But then there's no legislation to penalise so, them, is there? Yeah. So, so part of the technical issue here is about uh, is is defining it so there is no grey area. It's black and white, and there are some technical issues that we need to work through so that we're quite clear on that definition and how it will be applied. Uh, and that's what we're working on just now to see how we can take that forward. Okay. Thank you. And just before we move on, can I just say that I, I've been particularly taken by the, by the argument about parking in front of drop curbs, and it, it's perhaps as a result of this committee that I now look to see where drop curbs are. Some of them are in Inverness, are in loading bays, which is an interesting place to have them. So it may just not be that a blanket uh, place for, for drop curbs and parking in front would actually preclude. So there may need to be some moved, because I think the whole issue is very important. Cabinet Secretary, uh, we're now going to take, a, I think, another pause just while we allow the committee, uh, sorry, evidence, witnesses to change over. I'll get it right eventually. So, short pause. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, now, we'll now move on to the third part of this evidence session, which is on roadworks, canals and regional transport partnerships. Uh, can I welcome Kat Kane, the roadworks policy officer, Jan Gray, the policy manager on regional transport partnerships, Brian Spence, the canals policy officer, and Kevin Gibson, a solicitor. Uh, and the first question on this section is from uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary Panel. Um, I want to talk about the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner. Our witnesses have been broadly supportive of the proposed new powers um, and the new duties and requirements placed on those carrying out roadworks. Um, but I want to ask you about one particular thing to start off with. Um, one of the, the issues that has come up in our evidence session was the power of unannounced entry to premises. Um, and is this proportionate for investigating roadworks issues? I believe it is, yes. Um, uh, on the basis that the uh, purpose of the, uh, the inspection being carried out is to allow the commissioner to establish the facts. Um, in particular circumstances. Uh, but this is a, a power which uh, does require them to get a warrant or for the purposes of actually making entries. So it's not uh, as though it's a process that they don't have to go through to check as to whether it's appropriate and is required. Uh, very often these types of inspections will be taking place on live carriageways um, uh, in uh, uh, limited conditions as well. Um, but it does give them the power where there is a situation where a contractor may be obstructing their ability to get access to the necessary information they require for carrying out their inspection uh, for the commissioner to look at where they require to get a warrant for the purpose of making uh, uh, to be able to get access. So um, I believe it's necessary. Um, I would hope it doesn't require to be used much, uh, but given the importance of the role, I think it's important they have the ability to have recourse to taking uh, 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 forced entry if necessary. And what qualifications um, and standards would be used by the inspectors um, when they're accessing work sites? Uh, in terms of the qualifications for the inspectors themselves? Yes. 
Um, uh, I'll get officials to maybe give you more detail about exactly the type of uh, qualifications they have, but the individuals who will be carrying it out should have a good background knowledge uh, within the industry and an understanding of uh, the inspection standards that they're applying uh, during the course of any, stand any inspection. But um, uh, Kat, can you maybe give you a bit more of a, uh, a feel for the types of qualifications that they may have? Yeah, I mean, uh Luckily, sorry, that on you. Luckily, there, there's one standard um, for operatives and one for supervisors uh, for the whole of the UK, actually. Um, which every, it's the industry standard that everyone already works to. So any inspector of a site, no matter whether they're there as the person digging the hole or the person going to inspect the hole, as happens just now with local authorities, it would be the training and accreditation group standard street works qualification for an operative or for a supervisor. I'd expect supervisor for an, a commissioner inspector. OK, um, thank you. We, we spoke to um, Openreach um, in one of our evidence sessions, and they've raised concerns about um, the security of their infrastructure and the requirements to share this on the Scottish Road Works Register. Now, it, it was mentioned that in the past it was maybe a concern about commercial sensitivities, and it's now a concern about data security. Um, is, is that something that you're going to look at at stage two and what discussions are ongoing with Openreach and others about that? Yeah, of course. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of consideration. For example, the existing access to the website does have security provisions on it uh, to be able to get access to that information. And uh, we would expect that to be updated and to be, continue to be reinforced if there are further security measures that need to be put in place to restrict access to information uh, uh, on the system. So uh, there are provisions at the present moment. Uh, I would expect the Commissioner to keep that under review and to look at where they have to update it and put further security measures in place so that there is only access to the actual information for those who are entitled to get access to it. And does that apply not just to Openreach but to everyone else that's put in the add into the, the, the infrastructure? Yes, it would. Yeah. Right. So for the information that's made available on the uh, Commissioner's website to the, the what which which they host, um it would be for access to all of that information there would be a gatekeeping process for getting access to it. And who so so who would be able to access that information and, and what reasons would they need to give to be able to access that? So anyone with a statutory right to dig in the roads, so the undertakers, the roads authorities, there are certain special cases, the Commissioner's Office itself, um, and it would only be for the purposes of digging up the road for safe digging. Okay, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, during the evidence session with the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner himself, he raised the issue of lane rental charges, and I just wondered, is that something that the Scottish Government are minded to pursue at any time in the future? Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of this because lane rental charges have been used in England and Wales uh, as a way of trying to address issues around delays and the completions of works, etc. Um, and they've proven to be fairly effective in assisting them to do so. Um, however, the, I think the system that we have in place at the present moment actually it already does that. Um, uh, we've got a national system in place in Scotland uh, uh, which works very effectively. Our levels of delay are uh, shorter. Uh, than that for England and Wales. So uh, I don't think it's necessary to add it into the mix because I think the existing provisions which we have at the present moment are working uh, relatively well and they are working fairly efficiently as well, uh, given that delays in Scotland are below that of England and Wales uh, where they have the lane charging arrangements. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a series of supplementaries. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Just a brief one. Um, I, will the Cabinet Secretary understand? Uh, uh, drivers and businesses' frustration that when there's a series of roadworks in, uh, in one specific area, the example recently that came up was a particular street in Dundee that saw three different utilities come in over a very long period of time, causing havoc to their footfall and their businesses. And from a driving point of view, uh, there's nothing worse than seeing roadworks pack up at 5 pm on a Friday and then nothing takes place until a Monday morning. It just seems uh, you know, bizarre to, to, the, to most people. Is there anything in the bill that will give Scottish roadworks commissioners any additional powers? to ensure that utilities companies do the work as quickly as possible so we're not seeing you know, what, what is in effect a three-day halt to works because it's the weekend or because it's the evening. Well, look, um, uh, I not only understand the frustrations, I experience the frustrations myself 
Um, uh, so uh, I, you know, uh, uh, often come across uh, sites where, uh, you know, one week it's been dug up by one company, and then a couple of months later it seems to be getting dug up by an art utility company, uh, as a f which is a frustration. Part of the work that local authorities uh, do is to try and help to bring those types of things together. If there is a number of utility companies that are planning to carry out work in their area, uh, when they uh, 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 indicate that they're planning to do so, is to try and bring that together to try and minimise it. Um, uh, it, it clearly isn't a perfect system, um, given your experience, my experience, and I'm sure for everyone else. Uh, but there is an attempt to try and help to align these types of things as and when it can happen. One of the roles that the Commissioner's got is to actually look at inspecting how some of that process has been managed as well, to see if there are further things that could be done uh, in order to help to, to reduce that type of inconvenience. On the issue of working over the weekends, I suspect that's largely a commercial decision that's made by, by employers on... Uh, uh, could address that if it really wanted to. You could you could enforce uh, utilities to, to, to do work in the shortest time uh, possible, rather yeah. than leave it to commercial decisions just because it's too expensive to pay people overtime. The so there, there is some provision to do that. Oh, wait, can't maybe just to explain that to you. So uh, under the Nurse right now, there's already uh, a provision for local authorities to issue what's called a, a, a what's section one two five direction, which says roadworks have to take the, the shortest time as possible. I mean, there's, a, there's an obligation for that to happen anyway, but there's a specific direction and giving the Commissioner's Office additional powers to be able to see how authorities are using them, because it's absolutely going to be a, a level playing field. You'll be able to look at road authorities as well as utilities. You'll be able to get that information if that's not happening. Thank you. OK, we'll move on to Richard Lau. Uh, sorry, no, Stuart Richards first, and then, then you... There is a strict, there's a strict rotation, and I try and follow it to the best of my ability. Richard, yours is next, yeah, and then Stuart. I, I, I totally agree with the comments that made by Jamie Green and, and yourself, and the, the frustration is certain roads are actually dug up continually. Uh, you know, uh, laid down, dug up, laid down, dug up. I had uh, an example which I won't I've continually... Uh, hammered because I mentioned in my constituency. Um, but the other factor is that a lot of um, car drivers get annoyed when a lane is, co is coned off right, for work. And we know why. It's for safety reasons to ensure that the staff are, are down. But again, it's coned and they're not, nobody's on it. It's coned for maybe half a mile, quarter a mile, and there's nobody working on it. Very frustrating. So basically... I would agree that we should try and get companies working together to dig up roads at the same time and put down their utilities at the same time and also ensure that companies are using the time to ensure that work is ongoing so that it's minimal delay to motorists. Very frustrating, as you already said, Cabinet Secretary. There's no question. It's I'm that, not sure if there's a question there question. or a pitch for your job, Cabinet uh, Secretary. Do you agree? Do you agree? <laughs> do you agree? Do I agree with what? What I've just said. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what you're asking me, Richard. <laughs> so, but it, maybe a question you can take offline. I think Richard's <laughs> made his point. Stuart, and, and then I have a quick question for you. Sorry, I, I just wanted to return to the issue of uh, open reach and its critical infrastructure. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner website, and there are two bits of roadwork adjacent to this building. There's one at the bottom of the Canongate, and there's one starting on the 26th of November, uh, just 100 metres away, which is Scottish Gas Networks, uh, and the road will be up for 21 days. But it's here in the public domain, so I'm a bit puzzled as to the suggestions that some things are not going to be there. Uh, is that because, in legal terms, Open Reaches Network is part of critical national infrastructure? Uh, you know, its particular definition under UK security legislation, whereas the, the gas network, which I would have thought, you know, in many ways, you could do an awful lot more damage by knowing where the gas network is um, than you would by intervening on the telephone network. Yeah, that, that just displays the security. What you're looking at is the public-facing website, which shows the public what works are planned in the future. Anyone can access that. What OpenReach are talking about is the secure vault system on the Scottish Roadwork Register that you can't access, that you, you can't just get into a website. You need a, very, uh, you need a password, you need to be set up. So that information is not accessible to the public. Yes, I, I hear what you say, but I don't understand what it means. Uh, 
Can you explain what it is I'm not getting? Would, it, would if BT or uh, Open Reach, I do apologise, uh, were digging the road up at the front of the Parliament here, would it appear on the map here and would I see it? You would see it. You would see a so little. So what is it I'm not seeing? I'll explain. <laughs> if they have works planned, what you'll see on that website is a little roadworks, a, a man at works, 7001 sign, uh, that shows roughly what they're planning to do and roughly when they're planning to do it. What Openreach are concerned about are the lines on the map that show exactly where their cables are, exactly where their, jo uh, their junction boxes are, where their overhead is, which actually you can see without a map because it's overhead. Um, so that's what they're concerned about. It's the actual maps of where their infrastructure actually is when no one's digging it up. Fine. That clears my, uh, my fog of mystery. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, one of the questions that I continually get raised on roadworks is the fact that roadworks, uh, we've had mention of being left at weekends, but speed limits left at weekends on roads that appear to be functioning perfectly well when there's no workforce present. It is a constant problem. Uh, I, I could quote, you know, examples on the A9 right the way across uh, Scotland. So is that, is that a missed opportunity in this bill? Surely we should be removing roadworks uh, or re speed reductions at a weekend if there's no one there and there's no need for them. It's not in the bill. Yeah, the, the bill's not seeking to address this at all. It's dealing with the, the Scottish Roadworks Commission. Yeah, but should he uh, not have the power to do that, to uh, instruct that? Well, the, going back to the point that was made earlier on is that there are provisions where for local authorities to make sure that the work's been carried out as timelessly as possible within the shortest frame of time possible. They can issue direction if that's not the case. Um, there's no plans to make provision for contractors to remove roadworks over the course of the weekend um, uh, uh, while they're undertaking roadworks at that particular point. Uh, uh, I would expect the roadworks to be completed in timelessly a, a, a period as possible uh, to get it completed uh, rather than uh, uh, close it off at the weekend, open it back up on the Monday, uh, which will probably add time. It will probably take longer to do it that way uh, in itself. Um, uh, but there's no, there's no specific provision. It, that's not a bit that the bill's trying to address. OK. Uh, right, the uh, question now from Mike Rumbles. Mike. Um, canals. The bill is 75 sections, very comprehensive, and there's only one section dealing with um, canals, and that's about doubling the size of the board. So are we relying for legislation on the canal network, legislation of the 62 Act, which is more than half a century old, uh, and does the Scottish Government have any uh, plans to legislate in the area of canals? I'm thinking of... Uh, how to ensure that we keep the canals open because they are increasing for leisure use, increasingly uh, useful uh, in Scotland. But the, we seem to be relying on very old legislation. Any plans to, to update it? it? There's no plans to update the legislation at the present moment, um, largely on the basis that marked deficiencies have not been highlighted to us. Uh, some of the challenges which they will face in terms of uh, our canal uh, infrastructure is not so much to do with legislation, it's just to do with its age. Um, and uh, the need to keep that updated and upgraded, um, uh, which presents challenges. I've got canals to my constituency, and it's, it largely is, is down to issues relating to infrastructure challenges. So um, uh, if, if Scottish canals uh, uh, are highlighting there are particular deficiencies, or will highlight, do highlight that there are particular challenges around the existing legislative structure, I'd be more than willing to consider that, but at the present moment, they haven't done so. One example... Is there not a duty to keep the canals open, They're navigable? Uh, they have, we've had closures along the canals that have just been recently been renovated, and um, I'm just thinking of the Union Canal. Is yeah, there, there, is, there is a requirement for them to do that under the existing legislation. Well, they so, have been closed. So, so, yeah, so for example, um, we provide them with some additional funding to mm -hmm. address some bridge structures which had to uh, be invested in because they were resulting in uh, uh, canal closures as well. Uh, and what they try to do is, a, as a body, Scottish Canals try to programme their infrastructure investment programme to deal with the issues that could potentially result in um, uh, canal closures. But there will be incidents that occur uh, where they may require some additional resources to help to address those. And we'll provide them, as I say, in a couple of examples, where we provide them with additional resources to help to support, one of which was in my constituency, by chance, um, when the, when the bridge at, at Bonnie Bridge uh, failed and had to be, uh, had to be repaired. Uh, repaired. So, um, uh, uh, so there's no... 
you know, infrastructure fails will happen and they have to address those because they have got a legal requirement to maintain uh, commercial access. Okay. Write to the committee and just let us know under what legislation they have that requirement at the moment, because I'm not quite clear. Yeah. We can do that, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we now have some questions uh, on matters that members want to raise, individual matters. Uh, John. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, on the one hand, I'm not a fan of just throwing things into bills which haven't been consulted on uh, along the way. Uh, however, it has been raised with me the question of uh, littering from vehicles. And while that's, you know, in one sense, an environmental issue, it, it, it does raise a kind of serious issue because I know the signs are often put up in the motorways that actually risks lives because workers have to go out there and pick up the litter uh, when vehicles are going past at 70 miles an hour. Has the government any thoughts about either here or somewhere else uh, strengthening the legislation in that area? Uh, look, it's an issue I'm not unsympathetic to, um, uh, and I'm going to give consideration whether it's something that can be addressed in this bill or whether it should be addressed through other legislation, because there is nothing more frustrating than sitting behind a car and seeing folk just dump rubbish out the side of the window um, uh, at the side of the carriageway. Uh, and we've also uh, operatives having to work at the side of the roads and motorways as well um, in potentially dangerous conditions uh, because people just can't take the time to take their own rubbish and put it in a bin um, uh, uh, from their car. So uh, I've, um, uh, I've already uh, decided to give some consideration to this matter and whether it should be addressed in this bill uh, or whether it should be addressed in our piece of legislation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think that brings us to the end of our uh, questions on, on the Transport Bill. I'd like to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and the witnesses you brought along for the evidence that you've given this morning. I believe we're seeing you on the 5th of December to discuss a wider range of issues than uh, just the Transport Bill, but to do with other matters. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you on the 5th of December. I briefly suspend the meeting for five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, and we, we move back into session now to consider agenda item three, which is European Union Withdrawal Act legislation. We have received consent notifications in, relent, in relation to nine UK SIs, as detailed on the agenda. These cover the following policy areas, pesticides and fertilisers, animal health, organic products and intelligent transport. All the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. All nine have been categorised by the Scottish Government in general as making minor or technical amendments. Two of the proposed SIs on pesticides and fertilisers also contain provisions creating or amending powers to make regulations, including transferring current EU legislation powers to Minister. It, in the committee's paper, there are some broader related policy issues which may arise in the future, which the committee may wish to note and request a response from the Sc Scottish Government. Before I invite comments, I would just ask if any committee member wants to make any declarations in relation to these instruments and the consideration of them. And I am going to start it off by saying that I, in my register of interest, I have a recorded farming interest, and as these covers these areas, I would not ask the committee to note my interest. Does anyone else wish to? Peter. Uh, likewise, convener. Uh, obviously, these uh, instruments are concerning agriculture, and I have an agricultural interest also. Okay. Does anyone else know? That's fine. So, are there any comments from the committee um, uh, in relation to these, Stuart? Uh, just very simply, the recommendation that we write to the Scottish Government to confirm that we are content is the one I would wish us to adopt. Okay. Well, before we all agree, can I just put it then formally to say, is the committee agreed, therefore, that it should write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for, for consent to be given to the UK SIs referred to in the notifications to be given? Agreed. We are agreed. Um, I think that is, as it's therefore agreed... OK, well, there were some additional points that were raised. Does that... Do, do, which, which I think are important, and we could include those in the consent, just ask the government to consider them. I think that would be a sensible way to uh, approach. Is everyone happy to do that? Maureen? Which, which matters? I'll get, just start the clerks to identify those. And when? They're detailed in the papers. Uh, which? Which? It's paragraph, sorry. Paragraph 16. Isn't paragraph it? 16. Uh, and 20. 20. And uh, yeah, could you suggest that we write and just you know, note, ask the government to note these? Or yeah, that? it's just asking the government to note them as part of the consent process. I don't think there's anything complicated in there. Maureen, are you happy with that? OK, thank you. So we're agreed that we will write and ask them to note that. As that's therefore agreed, we're now going to move into private session. So I therefore close the meeting, uh, close this part of the meeting.